So now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Um, Dr. John Thompson received a BSA from the University of Toronto in 1963 and a PhD from the University of Alberta in 1966. After graduation, Dr. Thompson took up a position as postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Medical Biochemistry at the University of Birmingham in England. In 1968, he was appointed as assistant professor in the biology department here at the University of Waterloo. His career at the University of Waterloo progressed to include promotion to associate professor in 1972 and to full professor in 1976. In 1987, he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Dr. Thompson served as chair of the Department of Biology at Waterloo from 1980 to 1986 and as Dean of Science from 1990 to 2001. He is currently Associate Vice President for Research at the University of Waterloo, and Dr. Thompson's research focuses on programmed cell death. He has authored or co-authored more than 200 peer-reviewed scientific publications, and in 2005 was named to the ISI list of most cited researchers. Dr. Thompson. Well, thank you, Pascal. Is this microphone on? I guess it is. And uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I was very pleased uh, to receive a telephone call from Pascal. I think it was in early September of this year, inviting me to be a participant in today's proceedings. But I do have to acknowledge at the outset that <laughs> I'm not an expert in the topic of discussion for today. The topic of discussion for today is management of research data, and I have to confess right up front that I don't know very much about that topic. And the reason for that is because, well, I don't know if there's any good reason for it, but the reason I'm going to propose is because I've spent the bulk of my career generating data as a research scientist, and frankly have had little time to concern myself with the way in which this data is being managed. And it's only very recently that I've come to realize that the generation of research data is only one part of what is now being called a data cycle. Now, I was fortunate uh, to be asked to join the uh, policy working group of Research Data Canada uh, a few months ago, and that has provided me with an opportunity to learn firsthand to gain some significant insight into just how important it is uh, to properly manage research data, to curate the data, to preserve the data, and to do this not only on a national level, even a local level here, uh, but to do it on an international level. So I'm on a steep learning curve, and it's really because of that that I'm very pleased to be here. I'm hoping to learn today. I really am. Now, Pascal, in that telephone call last uh, September, uh, suggested that I should speak in particular to um, the role that Research Data Canada is playing on the national scene and indeed on the international scene. But before I get to that, I'd like to uh, bring your attention, if I may, to the CASRE 2013 conference which was held last week in Ottawa. Uh, the theme for the conference was Big Data, the advance of data-driven discovery. And I was uh, very fortunate to be able to attend this meeting. I found it very interesting. And in fact, there were a number of pithy take-home messages for me that I'd like to share with you because I think they're relevant. And bear in mind that I do so from the context of not being an expert in this area. So some of this was really quite new for me. The first message uh, that came through loudly and clearly to me was that research data must be managed. Why? because this is the only way that the full potential of research data is going to be realized for the benefit of society at large. And something I did learn that really caught my attention because it's going to impact me and other faculty members at the University of Waterloo is that very soon data management plans are going to be required in funding applications to the Tri-Council. So this means that when I apply or when any of you apply, to the Tri-Council for Funding, you're going to have to put a data management plan in that application in addition to the normal proposal. And what's even worse, or better, depending on your point of view, 
is that this is going to be peer reviewed. This data management plan is going to be peer reviewed and that information will factor into the decision about funding. Now this is very significant and the implications of it are really quite profound because my suspicion is that very, very few researchers have the faintest idea about how to go about putting together a data management plan. And so they're going to have to learn and they're going to have to learn from you people, particularly in the library, uh, who have some experience with this and uh, that's going to be a very interesting process and I, I suggest that we're not ready for it yet. I also learned, although I knew to some extent before that this was the case, that research data must be curated and preserved. And again, the reason is because this is the only way in which the full potential of primary research data is going to be realized for the benefit of uh, society at large. It's also clear that research data must be shared for the benefit of society at large. Now there are two factors, as I understand it, that are driving this. The first one is an interesting one, and, and it's a very real one when you think about it, and that is that most research data is generated in universities and in government research labs on the public dime. And if the public is paying for it, then one can argue that the public should have access to it. And that makes a lot of sense. But there's another reason which I think is rather more profound uh, for the fact that uh, to, 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 to suggest that research data must be shared. And it is this. It's now becoming increasingly clear that there is a lot of hidden information in primary research data. Information that if realized, if, if, if mined out of the data, can be used to tremendous advantage to enhance the objectives of society. And the only way that data is going to be mined is if we share it, get it out of the research community into the hands of others who can look at the data with fresh eyes and really see what's hidden in there and bring it to the fro. Now, the other thing that's interesting is that the concept of a data life cycle, which frankly was quite new to me, uh, is now gaining rapid momentum. And I'll say more about the uh, data research cycle or the, the data life cycle in just a moment. The other thing that became clear is that there is a, if you will, a data management movement that's taking place very quickly and rapidly gaining momentum. And this can be likened to an approaching tsunami. And the, the, the bad news is that universities in Canada and elsewhere across the world are completely unprepared for this. And I would argue that in Canada the universities are really unprepared and that universities in some other parts of the world are better prepared. So this is going to be a very interesting time ahead for all of us. Uh, we're not prepared. We have to get prepared very quickly because there's no question that this is going to happen and it's going to happen very fast. Okay. Well, I mentioned the data life cycle a moment ago and I thought it would be helpful if I just gave you a sense of what a data life cycle would look like and this came from the Castray meeting. We start out with planning and as I mentioned, the data management plan is going to now be a requirement for uh, funding applications to the CRI councils. We then come to the um, in task of collecting the data, generating the data, which is, which is what researchers have been doing for decades. And then the data has to be validated. It has to be validated against certain assurance criteria to ensure that it's correct. And then we come to the description of the data. Now this is going to happen in a variety of ways. But one of the ways that's being strongly advocated is that the data be described in such a way that it can be machine read. And then we can use the power of computing, for example, uh, to mine new information in that data. And then we come to data preservation. The data has to be properly curated and it has to be preserved. And then we come to the really exciting part of this, at least from my point of view, <coughs> not the only exciting part, but an exciting part which is to mine the data, to discover new knowledge, new information in that data <coughs> that can be used <coughs> to develop new technologies and to benefit society at large. And one of the ways of doing this, for example, is to use a fast search engine uh, to go through the data and try and mine new information. And this mining is in turn going to lead to the generation and integration of what's called metadata and that data will in turn be analyzed for still more new information. And then we go back to planning again for a new set of data. So that's what a data management, a data life cycle looks like. And um, you can see that there are a number of important steps. 
apart from the simple generation of data. Well, let me turn now to Research Data Canada, which is what Pascal asked me to speak about. Um, and I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, Research Data Canada actually grew out of a data summit entitled Mapping the Canadian Landscape, which was held in 2011. And this was a very important meeting. It was coordinated by the Research Data Strategy Working Group, and it was attendance by invitation only. And there were 160 invited participants from a broad array of sectors across the country, from academe, from the research funding agencies, like NSERC, for example, from government, from various NGOs, and of particular importance from the private sector, because the private sector is going to play a major role in this. And they're going to be major beneficiaries of this as well. The event was funded by multiple organizations from across these various sectors. And the objective, and this is the important part, the objective was to develop a vision, a vision for research data in Canada, a vision that will serve the country uh, down the road. And this vision actually became uh, or led to the formation of Research Data Canada. And let's look at the vision for a moment. So, it, one, one component of the vision is that Canada will become, and I say will become because we're not there yet, not by any stretch of the imagination, Canada will become a country in which open data, citizen science, that's an interesting turn of phrase, citizen science, evidence-based policy making, and broad public engagement with research data and science will flourish. So that's a pretty profound vision statement. Another component of the vision is that Canada will become a country in which research data are considered a public good. And there is broad recognition of the value of this data beyond the research community. Researchers talk to each other. That's no longer good enough. We need public engagement in the analysis and discussion of this research data. A further component of the vision is that all sectors of society, including industry, practitioners, data practitioners, um, the public, are actively exploiting research data for commercial purposes, for health purposes, for policy uh, development, and for various other creative purposes. And it is further envisaged that to this end, Canada will become a country in which research data are systematically managed and preserved and perhaps most important, reused. I, for example, publish my research data in peer-reviewed journals. Those peer-reviewed journals are read by my colleagues. And frankly, apart from some involvement with the private sector, that's as far as the data goes. That's no longer enough. We're not getting enough, we're not realizing enough of the potential uh, from that primary data. These data have to be reused, and that, that's a really important point. Okay, well, as well as um, developing a vision statement for Research Data Canada, uh, this summit also uh, set some goals for RDC, for Research Data Canada. And one of these goals uh, is to develop policies that will guide the management of data down the road for the country. A second goal or objective is to build capacity for data management and also to enhance education about data management. A third objector, objective at least, goal relates to infrastructure. Research Data Canada has been charged, along with other organizations, with putting in place the infrastructure that will be required right across the country to effectively manage research data. And this includes, for example, new servers computing capability that will allow us to mine uh, primary data, and so on. And, really important, the research culture has to change. I'm a, an example of the former research culture that frankly is no longer good enough. Uh, I generate research data, I publish research data, or have done so, and that's as far as it goes. We need to change that culture so that research, the research culture not only includes the generation of research data, but also the management of that data. And you will recall from the data cycle that I showed that there are many, many, many steps of this data life cycle 
uh, that are very important in addition to actual generation of the data. This is, a, this is going to be a challenge, I submit. It's not going to happen easily, it's going to happen over time, but uh, researchers are going to have to become aware of the fact that they no longer own the data themselves, that the data have to be shared, and that they have to play a role in ensuring that that data is properly managed. Funding is an issue. Um, we need funding for uh, man proper management of research data. Uh, that funding is not in place yet, uh, not to the point that we need it anyway. And the funding, of course, will lead to sustainability of this uh, particular mission. And finally, the uh, Research Data Canada has been charged with developing standards for the management of research data that will allow interoperability of the data. And that's also a challenging prospect. Okay, so a little bit more about Research Data Canada. Um, it is a stakeholder-driven and a stakeholder-supported voluntary initiative. This is all volunteer. There's no funding supporting this at the moment. And members of Research Data Canada, therefore, include a variety of stakeholder organizations across the country. Networks, libraries, high-performance computing, funding agencies, policy developers, Data, those interested in data intensive research, and CIOs, chief information officers of campuses, for example, universities. And these are organizations that should have, and that indeed will have, not only an interest in, but also a role to play in ensuring that the infrastructure processes and support are in place to realize the vision for research data in Canada. So put another way, the stakeholders come together in Research Data Canada to agree, to agree on direction and policies for research data and to ensure that all of the organizations that are involved in this effort are working in concert, working together, not working independently. And so finally to summarize, and this is a rather pithy statement, uh, Research Data Canada has been charged with developing strategy, facilitating communication and partnership among data initiatives, promoting education and training in data skills, measuring progress in implementing the vision, that's important, bringing attention to gaps, there are huge gaps at the moment, and acting as an important, or rather as a point of contact for Canada on the international scene. So that's a daunting prospect for Research Data Canada, uh, and one can only hope that it will be realized because it's important that it uh, be so. Turning now to another angle on all of this, uh, it's quite common these days to talk about the foundations of research infrastructure in a, di in a digital age. And if you think about this, there are really three pillars that constitute the foundations of research infrastructure. One of them is networks, the networks that are used for data transmission. Another is computing, the computing power that's used in some cases to generate the primary data uh, and in all cases to help mine this data. And then, we, of course, we have the data itself. This is perhaps the most important pillar. Now, let's look at these pillars in a little bit more detail to see what they actually involve. If we look at the network pillar, the major players at the present time in Canada are uh, Canary National, the various regional uh, networks, and, of course, research institutions, universities, colleges, hospitals, government research labs, and the consortium of university uh, chiefs, chiefs of information. Um, what is the word I'm looking for there? It's not chiefs of information. Uh, information officers. These are the people that are going to organize this, this, these networks on campus, and they're going to play an important role in ensuring uh, that this all works out well. What about compute? What, what do we have on the ground in the way of major players under the pillar or for the pillar of compute? We have Compute Canada, which plays a national role. We have various regional consortia, Compute Atlantic, Calco Quebec, Compute Ontario, Compute West, and we also have a number of specialized facilities, clouds, for example, that are in some industries and also in uh, some universities. And then we come to data, and this is where, frankly, everyone is involved. At the top here, not necessarily implying anything in particular, but we do have Research Data Canada, and as I've indicated, Research Data Canada has been charged with playing a major role uh, in this uh, new wave of uh, data management. 
We have Compute Canada and the regional consortia and the chief information officers, uh, all of who will play a role. Um, Canary, the network Canary, the uh, regional networks will play a role. CASRAE will play a role. And the researchers in universities, colleges, and hospitals will play a role. It will be important that these researchers not only pay attention to generating the data, but also to managing the data. The research libraries, libraries sorry, are going to play a major role. A lot of the work, if you will, uh, is going to be on the shoulders of research librarians and faculty members are going to be uh, requiring your assistance in a very profound way uh, if they're going to be able to adapt to these changes that are coming. Research data repositories, which often are parts of uh, libraries, are important, as are government research labs, funding agencies, and also government. Now looking at this in a little more detail, what has been accomplished to date by these the, the, uh, in respect of these pillars. Le looking first at the network pillar, one of the things that has happened that is really quite encouraging is that there is now quite clear delineation of responsibilities of the national level, at the national level, the provincial level, and at the campus level in terms of networking. These groups are working together now. Uh, there's also close coordination among the levels so that provinces are talking to provinces, campuses are talking to campuses, campuses are talking to provinces, and uh, provinces are, are also talking to the leaders at the national level. And the other thing I think that's important to recognize when we are thinking about the network pillar is that networking in Canada is in fact among the top ranked in the world. So we're doing really quite a good job already uh, in respect of the network pillar. Turning to the compute pillar, uh, on the positive side, we do have evolving relationships uh, between the national and regional uh, compute facilities. And what's interesting is that there is a growing burden of proof for the need for standalone facilities. And this is, this is quite interesting. And again, it has implications, certainly for the research community anyway. So for example, um, if, if a researcher wants to apply to CFI for computing equipment, servers, whatever, that application now has to be approved by Compute Canada. And that approval means that Compute Canada has to be satisfied that that standalone facility is actually required and that what the researcher needs to do with that proposed standalone facility cannot be done with any of the shared facilities. For example, we have SharkNet on this campus that many of you will be familiar with. And SharkNet uh, is a shared facility and a lot of our research involving computing is done on SharkNet. So when we apply for new equipment from CFI, for example, we have to make it clear that what we want to do can no longer be achieved, cannot be achieved on, on uh, SharkNet. So, the other thing that's uh, important here is to recognize that computing in Canada measures up very well internationally compared to facilities in other countries. Um, the, the one exception to this may be that we're lagging a bit behind in terms of serious high performance computing at the PETA scale and the EXA scale. But apart from that, we are very well placed. So once again, we're doing a reasonably good job with respect to the compute pillar. What about the data pillar? Here the news is not so good. We have Research Data Canada, which is in place. And as I indicated earlier, this is a stakeholder-driven model that recognizes that uh, the variety and diversity of stakeholders that have to be involved. And we have high hopes for Research Data Canada. However, there are some serious gaps when it comes to the data pillar. There is in particular a strong need for policy direction. At the moment, we have little direction. And we need direction at the funding level and at the technical level. Funding is particularly important. Um, funding for data management is not in place yet. And there, is, um, there are a few policies that are in place to direct us in terms of how to get that funding uh, in place. The Data pillar is the least coordinated of the pillars, of the three pillars that we've been talking about. And as I've indicated several times, it has the lowest level of investment. There's not much money that's uh, available for managing research data. Also, the capability for long-term preservation is very weak in Canada. It's the weakest part of an already weak pillar. So on the data side, 
the scene is not quite so rosy. And that's illustrated by this slide here. So over on the left, we have the network pillar, which I think is quite robust and relatively strong. We have the compute pillar, not quite as robust as the network pillar, but still reasonably good. And then we have the data pillar, which I think it's fair to say is woefully inadequate at the present time. Now, to provide a little more context to this on the Canadian scene, there are some glimmers of hope. Uh, there is, for example, an emerging approach to national coordination for research infrastructure. Not only do we need infrastructure to carry out the research, and that frankly has been very well funded through, for example, CFI, <clears throat> but we also increasingly will need infrastructure to help us manage these data. Servers, computing capabilities, and so on. And there is a growing national coordination of efforts to try and put this in place. So, for example, we have the Digital Infrastructure Leadership Council, which, is, which has responsibility for identifying gaps and developing measures to close those gaps. It's one thing to identify the gaps. The real challenge, of course, is to fill those gaps. We also have emerging leadership and collaboration among research and uh, research infrastructure funding agencies. Now, the funding agencies at the moment are particularly geared to funding the generation of primary data, as I've indicated already, and there's not a lot of uh, appetite at the present time uh, for funding uh, the infrastructure that we need for, re for data management, but I really do think that's coming. Now, the other thing that's important to put in context is the investment that we're making in research as a country. Substantial investments in data production have been made over time and continue to be made, but there's little funding, as I said already, for the, uh, the uh, management of research data. However, and this is a glimmer of hope, there is a growing recognition of the fact that there are serious gaps that need to be filled in data stewardship and data access. For example, we need data management funding. We need that ever so badly, that's why I'm harping on it. We need policies that will direct the management of research data. We need data management support uh, for, uh, we need support for the infrastructure that's necessary for management of data, and we need new skill sets. <clears throat> now, further, I talked about gaps. There are gaps in big science projects. Big science is being strongly supported. They're generating all kinds of data, but there are huge gaps in the way in which this data is being managed and mined. <clears throat> the data management support for small data projects is even more problematic. And the second thing we need to do is to develop a cadre of skilled data professionals. This is absolutely essential or we're not going to be able to uh, achieve our goals. So the Canadian, uh, another component of the Canadian uh, context is that this is a bottom-up initiative. It's largely bottom-up. Um, the uh, the uh, Research Data Canada, for example, is a bottom-up initiative, voluntary. And that's fine, but we need to appreciate that there are strengths and weaknesses to that approach. Okay, so what about on the international scene? Uh, we're making reasonable progress on the international scene. Uh, the G8 Global Research Infrastructure Dating Working Group, Data Working Group is in place and, uh, and they have completed and published an initial report. And I also want to draw your attention to the Research Data Alliance. This is an alliance that was formed quite recently uh, involving the European Union, Australia, and the United States. Canada was invited to join Research Data Alliance as a founding member, but wasn't able to muster the cash that was required to become a founding member. So what has happened in the interim is that Research Data Canada has sort of uh, jumped in and has taken the responsibility for maintaining close working relationships with Research Data Alliance, and this is one of the ways in which we can conti continue uh, to have um, to be, to be featured on the international scene. There's also a, a data site federation, which is playing a role on the international scene. And we have a data site Canada, which is part of data site federation, um, operative in our country. It's hosted by NRC. It's doing some really interesting and good work. Uh, we heard, I heard a presentation about uh, data site Canada at Castray and was really quite impressed with what they're doing. Okay. So at the end of the day, where are we? Well, it's clear that the Government of Canada spends in the order of $10 billion a year in support of research. But it's also clear that the vast majority of that money is used to support one small part, well, one important part 
of the uh, data uh, cycle, the data life cycle, and that's the generation of research data, and there's little money for the management of that data. What's important to recognize as well is that the lion's share of the research that's carried out using the support provided by the Canadian government is generating data that is in digital format. And this is an enormously powerful resource. And the unfortunate part of it is that neither the strategy nor the capacity to protect, nor the capacity to protect this public asset is in place. And this is a real worry. We have a huge asset there and we're not set up to protect it. And so I'd like to close with the proposition that meeting this challenge is in fact everyone's responsibility. No single group can do it. The university librarians can't do it on their own. The researchers can't do it on their own. We really do have to work together to make this happen. And it's for the benefit of Canada if we are successful in doing so. So thank you very much for your attention. We have a few minutes for um, uh, any questions that we have for Dr. Thompson. And remember that I'm not an expert in this area. <laughs> is there a definition of research data? Uh, is it just science data? Is it so science data? Can it be humanities data, business data? Uh, also, if within the science field, is it raw sensor data? Is it process data? What is research data? Well, I, I, I don't think research data has been properly defined yet, and I think that's in, to some extent intentional, because research data actually means everything. It certainly means science data, it certainly means social science data, uh, and frankly, it means all of the types of categories of data that you articulated. Now, that may not be good enough. It may be that we need to focus on that definition in order to focus our efforts on management of data, but my sense, and again, I'm not an expert in this area, is that, uh, that that focus is not there yet, and research data is being interpreted as data in the broadest context, for better or for worse. And I'd be interested in your views on whether it is for better or for worse. Well, I'm curious that you say that the majority of the data is produced in university research labs. It would seem to me that if the... And, and government, broad, and, and government research labs. But it would seem to me if the definition is that broad, the majority is probably produced in private, private industry. Correct. Very, very correct. Yes. So yes, and, and <coughs> you're right. There is a there is a dichotomy there. Confused, and, and yeah. ten million dollar, billion dollars, I'm sure, includes support of private industry. It, it, it probably it probably and does. Not, those aren't the tri-council numbers. That, that's way higher. Yeah, yeah, and it, it probably does. And and at least. Yes, and and. So in the context of management of research data, I suppose we can assume and should correctly assume that uh, the private sector entities that generate this data are already managing it for their own benefit. Um, and that's good. I mean, that's going to help society and help the economy in the longer term. And I suppose a fallout from that is that um, this data management that we're talking about is really management of data that's in the, that should be in the public sector, data that's funded by the public purse. I don't know if that helps Frank or not, but... Uh. Please try to narrow down the definition a little bit. <laughs> okay. Yes? So are we suggesting that even though it may be government-funded, private data could not become public? Well, I, I mean, I guess I would say that it, it, it probably isn't going to be made public, whether we would like it to or not, because industry is funding it and uh, industry is in competition with other industries. And they're going to keep that data pretty close to their chest, uh, I would think. And I, I think it would be hard to argue that it should be otherwise. Right, but if the government has funded their research, and they're using it for okay. private gains, is that going to become public? And why are we not engaging those guys? Because like the other gentleman said, there's already good practices out there. Why are they not engaged in this? Yeah, no, you, you've put your finger on a real conundrum. Because increasingly government, in an effort to promote technology development, if I can refer to the tech sector for a moment, and create wealth and create jobs, is co-investing with the research councils uh, 
in industry to support research. So it's very common, for example, for researchers at the University of Waterloo to have a, a research project that's funded by the government and by industry. And industry will have some, in, some uh, share of the uh, intellectual property that comes out of that. So you raise a very good point. What do we do about those data? Should the data that's generated through that research project be made public or not? And I don't know the answer to that question. It's a very, very tricky issue. If we're going to continue to have industry involved in supporting research, and I think that's a good idea, uh, not only for the University of Waterloo, but also for the country, uh, we are going to have to be quite flexible, have some flexibility anyway, uh, with respect to the extent to which the, country, the, the company is going to benefit from that research and benefit selectively because, as I say, they are in competition with other industries. So that's unknown territory, and uh, I think it'll be quite a significant challenge uh, to deal with that as we go down the road. <coughs> as we go down the road, excuse me. Okay? Hi. Out of the $10 billion that's spent on research, how much should be spent on data management? Is there a <laughs> Oh gosh, I, I, I'm really, I don't know if you heard the question, but the question is what proportion of the $10 billion spent on research should be spent on management of research data? And I don't know if I'm a good one to even come close to hazarding a guess on that because I don't know the costs of managing research data. But I, I, I can say that it should be a significant proportion, let me say that. I, I'm hesitant to put a number on it. Maybe you could put a number on it. I didn't know if you might have heard people talking about it in no. recent meetings. No. Do you have a sense of what it should be? Um, anywhere between 2 and 10 percent. Okay. 2 and 10 percent? Does that sound reasonable? I think it does. Okay. But that's just very limited experience. Yeah. Yes? I, in the policy discussions and stuff, there's a good talk about philosophy for, if we're going to move towards kind of open access data and, and making it publicly available, um, timeline for data release and kind of the philosophy towards that. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a very good question and the answer to it is yes. And it's really important not only for industries but also for individual researchers to have some time to either protect the data if it's uh, commercially uh, viable or commercially valuable <coughs> or at least to publish it. In the, in the context of being a researcher because we live in a world of publish or perish. If you don't publish, you perish. Um, the, time, the time frame is variable. Um, I would say it goes anywhere from six months to two years. Uh, I know, for example, that uh, when students, research students at the University of Waterloo are involved in research that is supported by companies, we always write into the agreement uh, a provision for <coughs> withholding any release of this information until such time as the company has an opportunity to uh, patent it, to, to protect it, but recognizing that the student has to defend his or her thesis and that at some point the data has to become public. And also the student needs to publish. So after a certain period of time, it will be possible to publish and make the data publicly available. And, and th there is precedent for that now. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to ask about the, the verified step in the, in the life cycle. It seems like maybe that's uh, a, leak, a weak link in a way. There's, there's not a lot of studies that are, I did exactly the same thing someone else did, and yeah, it, it, it checks out. Um, I know there was, a, I think, a recent study published in Science where someone faked papers and they got them uh, peer reviewed. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder what, if you think that that step is, how that's achieved in well, it's, it's certainly a very important step, and my sense is that it, to some extent it's being well achieved at the moment. Um, there is this phenomenon called reproducibility of results, and uh, it's not uncommon for journals to accept papers 
that are reiterating data that's already been published for verification. But uh, I think there's another component to this too, and that is going through the data and getting rid of all the, the noise. If, if the data doesn't make sense when you analyze it, then you need to go back and look at the primary data more carefully, look at how it was generated to see if there's some glitches. I think that's also a component of, uh, of, of data verification. So let me be a bit clearer. There are two strategies of doing this. One is to uh, ensure that someone else can repeat the data and get the same results. The other thing, the other part of verification is for the person who has generated the primary, primary data, him or herself go through it and verify it using all kinds of checks and balances before it's actually used and before it's released. <clears throat> so I, t I see it as two, 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 two steps, if you will, uh, working in parallel. Does that answer your question? Yeah, well, I was wondering if you're worried about there being pollution in, in data and in publishing in general, and if that's... Am I worried so about... There's so much data being generated. Yeah. There can't be someone to verify what everyone's doing, because no one wants their job to be just verifying what, mm -hmm. what other researchers are doing. Mm -hmm. I don't lie awake at night worrying about it, but uh, uh, I think you raise a very good point. Um, <clears throat> uh, I would hope that it's true that uh, intentional pollution of data is very, very rare. <clears throat> and I, I happen to believe that is the case. Uh, it's the unintentional pollution of data that we need to worry about. And I think that's a fact of life, of uh, doing research. I mean, there is going to be some noise in data that's there unintentionally and that may not be caught at the time the data is released. Hopefully it will be caught as part of the data management process when one goes through the data and generates metadata from the primary data. Okay. <clears throat> yes. I was just wondering, um, OAE stated that the RDC was looking at... I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Earlier you stated that the RDC was looking at generating kind of standards and protocols for you know, kind of data sets and how this data should be managed. Like, is there a timeline in place of when you think about this, or is it very fluid? And I haven't heard a specific timeline other than to say that it is urgent <clears throat> and it's certainly a very vital component of the uh, data management process. But in terms of a timeline, I'm not aware of a timeline that's being specified. Perhaps someone else in the audience is. Yes? I'm actually a member of the Standards and Interoperability Working Group with RDC. And we had a phone call just earlier this week. We're trying to actually um, survey what people use in terms of standards and to interoperate data repository so that they, we can all speak to each other. And I believe that we're really trying to get um, some recommendations formed within the next uh, 14 months, so by the end of 2014. Who knows what will actually happen? It is a voluntary activity, but uh, we're, we're working hard to see how much we can get done uh, within the next year or so. And when these publish, I mean, Pretty much every single point that's been raised in this program is one which is featured in my own research group as a you know, cause of concern, whether that's working with industry, you know, the data that we, you know, we would like to make all of our data for public access. And I assume on that so it's open access data policy would probably wind up having to anyway, especially given the, the nature of the research that was interrupted in there, what we marry. Um, but our concerns all of these, is that something which RDC discusses? Um, I mean, the gentleman here who raised the, kind of the concern of what is research data? Is it the final data? Is it the QA, QC data? Is it the raw data? Like what to make available publicly um, without it being <coughs> to interpretation that is either misguided, wrong, or what have you, when you do not have the resources well, you raise a very good point, and I think that underlines the importance of the data assurance step in the data life cycle. I think there's really a, there, there's going to be an increasing responsibility on the part of those who generate the, the primary research data to subject it to assurance tests, particularly because, as I understand it, Open access to data doesn't just mean open access to data that's published. It means open access to all primary data, all of the raw data from which the conclusions are drawn. 
So that data is going to have to be combed very carefully to ensure that it's not uh, full of noise. So that, that will be important. And that will be another uh, responsibility that researchers will have to bear uh, in the context of uh, uh, riding this swell, if you will, of uh, data management. We have time for maybe one more question before our next speaker. Yes. This is perhaps more of a comment than a, than a question. So perhaps as a counterpoint to these kind of issues that are also prominent in my lab, which is you're generating all this data, but there's a lot of work involved in metadata annotation, curation, that I try to frame it in such a way that while doing those kinds of things is actually congruent with the goals of our lab, um, sort of by itself, that I want my trainees to be very careful about how they process their data, how they annotate it, how they organize their own data management mm -hmm. for their individual projects. <coughs> it's actually helpful to them to understand that they're operating sort of in this larger scheme of things where it's not just about their project, but other people are going to have to interpret their <coughs> data, look at their work. And I think that's actually a positive force in, in research that it, it makes trainees aware of those sorts of things. Um, that instead of seeing it sort of as a, as a burden in a sense, which in, in some ways it is, there's, there are also many positives even for, the, for an individual lab sort of when it's not um, yet in this bigger context of how do you actually share the data, but just to improve good practice in a mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think it's necessarily, uh, oh no, as researchers, we're going to have to spend more time doing this and pay more money and it's going to be terrible. Like there's also good things for that. Kudos to you. You're a young researcher. You're more tuned into the importance of this than are folks of my generation. <laughs> but uh, this is very exciting. Thank you for sharing that with us. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thompson.